So, um, good morning. Um, I want to start out thanking Paul Allen, um, Tom Scalak, and Kathy Richmond for making it possible for me to work on a project that I think is um, exciting. Having said this, um, when I was a little boy, I never thought I would be working this line of research because it actually sounds very boring because um, in essence, I'm a clockmaker, you know. <laughs> I develop aging clocks. And um, to tell you about the project, um, um, so we developed um, a very accurate biomarker of aging. It tracks age. Really, in every tissue and organ, any cell type that contains DNA. And um, this shows, of course, the Vitruvian man by Leonardo that shows the perfect physical dimensions of the human body. But it was never um, clear whether there's um, also a time access to not only human development, but also aging. Is there something like the age-appropriate um, pattern, molecular pattern of a cell type or tissue? And so we developed an, um, a multi-tissue measure of aging in humans. And as part of this um, project, we will develop the same in mice. But more than that, um, we want to develop aging clocks for all mammals, ideally for all vertebrates. And um, the grand challenge is really to develop what I call a universal clock that could really measure age across species. Um, to start out slowly, these um, accurate measures of age are based on uh, cytosine methylation. And cytosine methylation plays a very important role in um, cell differentiation, uh, development, regulation of gene expression, of course, stability of the chromosomes, uh, the DNA structure, um, suppressing transposable elements and cryptic transcription. All of that is well established. There's also some literature that um, suggests that methylation could play an important role in aging. And um, there's really a, a smoking gun that shows that methylation could be a, a key driver of aging, at least in vertebrates. And that smoking gun is uh, really this human multi-tissue DNA methylation age estimator. Um, so as the name says, this methylation age estimator estimates the age based on DNA methylation, but it applies to all tissues and cell types. And the mathematical algorithm underlying this clock is quite simple. So in step one, you have to measure the methylation levels of 353 locations across the genome. You get then 353 numbers, and you form a weighted average of these numbers, carefully chosen weighted average. But that is not yet at the level of years. So to get a measure in units of years, you transform it in a nonlinear fashion. And the result of this algorithm is then this age estimate, which is sometimes called epigenetic age, but more precisely, DNA methylation age. And the most striking thing about this algorithm is that nowhere did you have to specify the source of DNA. Does the DNA come from blood or from brain or from any other cell type? So it's a universal algorithm that applies to all tissues. Um, to illustrate that, look at the right panel where this, uh, these are all test set evaluations of this age estimate across various types of um, tissues and cell types. So the uh, human epigenetic clock applies to neurons, to glial cells. It ap applies to neutrophils or various blood cell types, really to all, not only sorted cells, but also to uh, complex tissues such as prefrontal cortex. Um, I briefly want to mention an email that I got in April by Tao Sheng Huang, who said, um, here's a data set, can you check your clock? And um, look at this correlation. It validates at a correlation of one, you know. So <laughs> that happened only twice, I should say, you know. But it, it's still remarkable that a, a genomic biomarker uh, leads to this very high accuracy. But let's think about why it is so accurate in, in the samples from Dr. Huang. First of all, he had lots of blood samples from children. 
So the epigenetic clock is particularly accurate in children. Um, which brings me to a point, the epigenetic clock is not just the measure of aging, it's actually um, arguably plays an important role in development. The, the epigenetic clock is um, really a continuous readout that connects um, changes across the entire lifespan from prenatal samples all the way to centenarians. Um, now, when you develop a clock that is that accurate, you actually um, get pushback from researchers because they say, if something is so highly correlated with age, how could it be biologically meaningful? You know? And to understand the criticism, um, bear in mind that what one is after is to find measures of biologic age. You want measures that relate to various health conditions. And so in the last few years, our lab and others have really related these epigenetic clock and um, biomarkers to a host of conditions. And here I show you conditions sorted by um, the, um, the initials. So for, ranging from Alzheimer's disease, where we found an association in the prefrontal cortex, all the way down to a progeria Werner syndrome. You see the relationships to heart disease, uh, uh, measures of frailty, menopause, sex, so women are slightly younger than men. Um, but when you carefully look at this table, you will see that um, you always want to keep track of the source of DNA. So some of these associations can only be found in one organ, for example, liver, but not in blood or vice versa. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is that in my lab, of course, we um, have developed additional human biomarkers of aging. So we have a new biomarker which we call PhenoAge, and it's not yet published, but it, it is absolutely striking in what it can accomplish. It's a, actually a, a shockingly accurate predictor of how long you live, whether you get heart disease. It predicts certain incident, um, certain cancer types, it relates to um, cognitive performance. So we have a, it's a blood-based biomarker that relates to mild cognitive impairment. And so just stay tuned for that. You know? it, it's just not the um, topic of my talk today. So why develop an epigenetic clock for mammals? We have really powerful biomarkers in humans. Why in mammals? And there are several reasons. First of all, we need these biomarkers for preclinical studies, for in vivo studies. So in collaboration with Ken Raj, we found um, a particular molecule that really reverts the age of keratinocytes. So that's an in vitro studies. And so arguably you would say, um, sorry, um, this is a very powerful way of possibly resetting age. But really, this needs to be evaluated in mice and ideally in other um, uh, model systems, for example, the mini pig or even dogs. Um, along those lines, I want to mention that several groups have published papers on mouse epigenetic clocks. And when you look at these papers, the results are absolutely stunning because every gold standard anti-aging intervention that we know in mice seems to slow the epigenetic age. For example, um, there are certain mice like Ames dwarf mice that live much longer, and sure enough, their epigenetic age is younger. Or calorie restriction, which is known to um, slow um, aging in mice. Again, it slows the epigenetic age. Now, these publications are important um, um, articles along that line, but the truth is, um, the, the published clocks are not yet accurate enough. Uh, they, they face um, technological problems in terms of the measurements. They were based on a reduced representation by sulfide sequencing, and I can discuss later. It, it, it's actually um, very difficult to make this technology work in a, in a lab. So as part of this Allen grant, we will um, develop really highly reproducible um, um, mouse clock that is ready for prime time, uh, and I hope to collaborate with many of you on your various mouse models with that clock really in the spring of next year. I want to come to another important application of these clocks, which is 
what explains really cross-species differences in lifespan? Why does a mouse live two years and a human 80 years? You know? And there's a superficial answer to that, which is at the organismal level. So here I show you some data from um, another group where they plotted body mass versus longevity. And you, you see a very strong correlation. And a more careful analysis will show that both body mass and the ability to fly are really important determinants of lifespan in vertebrates. In other words, it's all about how many predators you have. You know? <laughs> if, if you can avoid predators as a species, you will end up living longer. I call it a superficial solution because we would, of course, like to understand the molecular reasons behind it. Because if we understand um, the molecular reasons for longer lifespans, maybe we can come up with um, uh, drugs that enhance it in humans. And um, as part of this proposal, we will test the hypothesis that age-related changes in methylation patterns at specific locations really explain these differences in lifespan. So in other words, um, we believe that the ticking rates of epigenetic clocks could really explain why some species live longer. And um, here I show you one graph that we produced. There's humans, dog, and mouse. So wonderful correlation. That's our nature paper. You know? <laughs> no, but I'm just joking. I, I mean, <laughs> because it's ridiculous to um, draw a line through three points. You know? um, as a matter of fact, when you look at the field of evolutionary biology, many uh, false positives were reported because people looked at, let's say, 20 species. And then five years later, somebody added 10 species, and the results completely fell apart. So I said, um, let's just really design a large-scale, rigorous study, 50 uh, species, and just really investigate lifespan and um, to check this hypothesis that epigenetics and methylation matters. Um, I want to mention that uh, our group and others have developed various epigenetic clocks, and one in dogs or in whales even. But um, we really as a field face challenges. One is there are large numbers of species. Hundreds or thousands of animals uh, could lead to separate aging clocks. Now, not only is that very expensive, but there's this fundamental problem that, um, of comparability. Because uh, these publications use slightly different technologies. They look at different um, locations in the genome. So. Um, I don't want to end up where the E. coli field ended up, <laughs> as a previous speaker mentioned, uh, that um, th there is uh, less um, cohesion. So therefore, um, we pursue here an overarching goal, as, um, which is we want to develop an epigenetic age estimator that actually applies to all mammals. And we call that the universal epigenetic clock. And in order to make this feasible, we need to start really with highly conserved uh, sequences. So in step one, we look at highly conserved CPGs. In step number two, we will then build um, age estimators in, in 50 different species. In step three, we will want to look for commonalities to arrive at this universal clock. And I, here I just want to show you the synteny between humans on the left-hand side and dogs. And what you see is there's actually strong synteny across genomes. And um, we want to then develop a custom chip that leverages that. And um, here I show you some results from our team member, Adriana Spurley, who has carefully analyzed sequence conservation. And she has come up with these um, highly conserved sites across 50 different mammalians or species. And so we are working now with Illumina to, to develop a custom mammalian chip that will profile these uh, sites. But the question is whether 30,000 highly conserved CPGs on such a chip would actually work. Would they allow us to estimate age? And there are really two parts of the question, which is, are 30,000 CPGs enough given that in humans we have 28 million, so arguably this is a small fraction. 
But the next question is, well, what if you only focus on conserved CPGs? Maybe you miss important parts of the biology. So if this was a regular grant review, it would, of course, never be uh, get through the review. But I want to show you um, some results that show it's actually doable. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. So um, here, um, Michael Thompson and our team developed a very accurate mouse clock by focusing only on 1,400 highly conserved CPGs. So think about it. We start out with 1,400 regions in the genome and develop an age estimator. If, if you had asked me this question two years ago, whether it's feasible, I would have said absolutely impossible. You know? However, it works. And so the hope is that once we have more than 1,400 CPGs, when we have 30,000, we get actually even stronger correlations. What about humans? So I went back to the human data, the human Illumina data, and I said, can I develop a multi-tissue clock based on only 676 highly conserved CPGs? Again, I mean, this, uh, you would so this sounds crazy because it seems so lopsided. But here, here I show you this human clock in different tissues. So it is actually quite accurate. Um, this is the same clock. So um, look at these correlations. So we get correlations 0.9 of this highly conserved clock, quote unquote. And notice again, it starts from development H0 all the way to 100. So these clocks really um, allow us to link um, um, development to aging. Why study 50 different animals? Why not 30? Why not 20? I mentioned it. Really, for modern phylogenetic comparative approaches, you need a good sample size. 50 is really what you need to avoid all sorts of confusions in the field. But also, by um, generating a clock for all of these species, we um, allow standardizations. Different uh, research communities can talk to each other. So I think not, um, these clocks will not just be useful for um, people who study development or aging, but also more generally evolutionary biologists, veterinarians may use it, animal shelters, conservationists. You know, so many people have actually approached me from these communities to ask me to work with them. Um, overall, I feel these epigenetic clocks allow us to solve long-standing problems. And to give you some historical perspective, um, back in 1988, it was recognized that biomarkers, molecular biomarkers of aging, are absolutely critical to make any progress when it comes to anti-aging interventions for slowing aging. And so there was this RFA that asked um, us for, for biomarkers of aging that worked in a species where there's a well-defined genetic background. And unfortunately, this, uh, this project was as important as it was really ahead of its time, because at the time, we didn't have um, arrays. We didn't have DNA sequences. Um, the technology wasn't there. So it took over 25 years to um, address this challenge. And surprisingly, it was addressed in the human species. But why humans? It was a technological reason, because for humans, there was an Illumina array. And more importantly, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands, of samples available. And um, so sample size matters. And, but going back to the original RFA, there was a, oh, sorry, um, there was a question to um, look for something with a well-defined genetic background. Clearly, it asked for model organism. And so going back to address it, we will, of course, now um, uh, hopefully, if we are lucky, solve it in a pretty comprehensive way. And um, I'm particularly interested in phylogenetic studies that help us understand, so why is it that humans live so long compared to other species? When you look at our body mass, we should, uh, we should not live that long as we do. And, um, and of course, by understanding these molecular reasons why we live longer, we hope to find ways to promote then human health. In the proposal, um, uh, the proposal is very ambitious in that it tries to develop a universal clock, the same set of CPGs and a mathematical algorithm that then allows us to me measure age in, in many, many species, hopefully all mammals. 
But um, even if we fail, um, there's no doubt, and I, I've shown you data on feasibility, there's no doubt that we will develop highly accurate and reproducible species-specific age estimators. And um, I want to um, acknowledge again um, the um, Allen Frontiers group, and I want to mention my UCLA collaborators, Matteo Pellegrini, Jason Ernst, Michael Thompson, Adrianus Burley, Dan Geshwind, Richard David, and Jake Lucis. Thank you so much. We have time for one question. You? Uh, <laughs> two quick ones. One is, do you think the clock is reversible if you had a way to remove methylations? And secondly, does this happen also in plants? Yeah, so I remember the proposal is about vertebrates, and uh, there's a reason for it, because we are focusing on something called cytosine methylation. There are other types of methylation, adenine methylation, but cytosine methylation is really critical in vertebrates, so I'm, I'm a bit cautious. Um, I hope to develop similar clocks at some points in invertebrates, but it won't be cytosine methylation. Um, when it comes to plants, I won't go there because plants are quite different in terms of how they age, you know. <laughs> they have, um, it's really a different cup of tea, you know. And what was your other question, sorry? Um, if you could reverse the clock. Oh, reverse, so absolutely. I mean, I'm, that's what we're working on. I, I mean, I, I think we have here a phenomenal tool to really query compounds or even existing treatments. That my big hope is that we can repurpose treatments that are being used to treat cancer and just say, change the dose a little bit and it actually slows the epigenetic clock, you know. Uh, you know so we have a, um, a wonderful readout for the, in certain ways, I consider it to be one of the root causes of aging. Just to briefly mention, yesterday we talked all about Alzheimer's disease, how complex it is, and we don't know where it starts. I, paradoxically, I think aging is much easier. You know, one would think aging is even more complex as heart disease and AD because it seems to combine it. But that, in my own experience, that's the opposite is true because you're dealing with the root cause of innate aging that's very much under genetic control. So I think there's a good chance we understand the molecular underpinnings and um, develop targets. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.